Hello once again, and if you don't know already, I'm Scott Florence, and just now I'm going to be explaining what the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle is. And there's going to be something slightly different from normal at the end, so do check that out, as it'll give you a bit of a warning of what's going to be coming up. And what the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle basically is, is that due to quantum phenomenons, you can never know for certain exactly where a particle is and what its momentum is or where it's going. Now let's start off by explaining the experiment that shows the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Imagine that you're firing a laser through a slit and there's a screen on the other side and on the screen you see what you expect, the point of the laser. And as you make the slit thinner and thinner, what you see is this area of light gets thinner and thinner until it gets thin enough. And as it gets thinner and thinner then, the slit actually gets wider and wider and spreads out. Now this is because as the slit's getting thin enough, you know ever more precisely where the photon that's travelling through the slit is. And because of that, the momentum becomes less and less certain, causing it to go in a variety of different directions rather than just straight through the slit. And the way you work out the uncertainty in the momentum is Planck's constant divided by the width of the split. So the smaller that the split is, the greater the uncertainty. And the full equation for this is the uncertainty in the position times the uncertainty in the momentum is greater than or equal to the Planck's constant divided by 4 pi. But you may also see it's written as the uncertainty in the position times the uncertainty in the momentum is greater than or equal to an h with a line through it divided by 2. And that h with a line through is just Planck's constant divided by 2 pi, so it's exactly the same thing. Now the next example tends to lead to a misunderstanding, especially for those people that aren't aware of this first experiment that I explained. And this next experiment is called Heisenberg's Aperture. And Heisenberg's Aperture is basically a microscope. And as you see up there, it's a particle, which is the little circle, attempting to be measured by this microscope, which is the thing that's above it. Now in order for this microscope to see it, a photon needs to interact with the particle, otherwise it would just be shrouded in darkness. And when a photon interferes with this particle, by Compton scattering, it releases a lower energy photon in a random direction, which could be up into the microscope, and that leaves the particle with some extra energy, so now that you know approximately where the particle is, you know less about its momentum because it's just gained some from the effects of Compton scattering. Now the way you work out the uncertainty of the position in this case is by knowing the angle of the aperture, which is the angle shown by theta there. And the uncertainty in the position is the same as the wavelength of the photon that's fired at the particle divided by sine of the angle of the aperture. So clearly, in order to decrease the uncertainty, you also need to decrease the wavelength of the photon that's fired at the particle. That means that the photon also has more energy that it's giving to the particle, which means that the particle is gaining more momentum. Now the misunderstanding that this produces is the idea that Heisenberg's uncertainty principle is only caused by our poor techniques of measuring things. But the first experiment showed otherwise, because the thinner the slit, the less certain the momentum is, and you're not adding any extra energy to the particles or photons there. Now there are two main analogies that I can think of. One of which is imagining the particles like a claustrophobic cat. If you put this claustrophobic cat in a box, and this box is about one cubic mile, then the cat isn't going to feel agitated by this box, and it will quite happily just laze around and do nothing. So you will have more or less no idea where the cat is inside the box, but you will have some idea that most likely the cat is going to be fairly still, and so the uncertainty in the momentum is quite low. But if you put the cat in a box that's just half a cubic meter, then this cat is going to be very agitated. You'll know pretty precisely where it is because it's in this box that's not very big, but it's going to be very agitated and it's going to be flinging itself about trying to get out of this box. That's one way to think of it. But another way to think of it is probably thinking of the particle as a troll. It sees that you want to find out exactly where it is, so it's going to let you find out where it is, then it's going to do its best to go elsewhere in a random direction that you have no idea about. Or if you want to know exactly how fast it's going, it will let you find out how fast it's going, only it'll jump about in space. Now Heisenberg's uncertainty principle isn't only for position and momentum, it's also for uncertainties in energy and time. It's exactly the same formula, the uncertainty of 
energy times the uncertainty in time is greater than or equal to Planck's constant divided by 4 pi. And it's because of this that virtual particles can form. Virtual particles are just particles that pop out of nothing in a vacuum and shortly after annihilate with each other as well. When these particles form, there is an energy depth in space, which means that these particles have to annihilate or something else has to repay this energy depth. And it's because of this that Hawking's radiation can occur. Now, Hawking's radiation is the theoretical concept that around the event horizon of a black hole, which you can find out about here. When these virtual particles pop into existence, there's a chance that one of them will be on either side of the event horizon, which will cause one of them to be sucked into the black hole and the other one to be flung away from it. And this Hawking radiation allows black holes to die, basically because instead of the particles annihilating and repaying this energy debt, part of the black hole's mass repays this energy debt. So over a vast period of time, a black hole would be able to die out. That's all for now and thanks for watching. If you think I've earned a subscribe and like, please do so. And thanks to all of you who've been favouriting and sharing, and especially to those of you who've been commenting, because we've had some interesting conversations in the comments down below in the past. And JKing98104, if you're still watching these videos, a while ago you requested that the intros come back and I have finally got round to making a new one. It's not quite as good as what I was aiming for, but after I saved it the first time, it took two hours to save this one minute clip and its size was 12 gigabytes. So I'm just going to leave it as it is now. But instead of bloopers today, as they seem to be getting a bit repetitive, here's the intro that I'm going to be putting a segment of in the start of videos in the future. And FYI, I am legally allowed to use this music that's playing over it. Hooray for royalty-free cheap music. So then I will see you next Sunday.